Welcome to Module 3.6, Sequencing Strategies for SARS-CoV-2. This is part of the COVID-19 Genomic Epidemiology Toolkit from CDC's Office of Advanced Molecular Detection. My name is Dr. Shatavia Morrison, and I am a Bioinformatics Unit Lead with the CDC. This module introduces some strategies to consider when deciding when and how to use genome sequencing to assist with epidemiological surveillance and investigations of SARS-CoV-2. Be sure to check out the toolkit's other modules, which include a combination of case studies and training materials to help you get started supplementing epidemiological data with genomic data. Modules in part one of this toolkit provided an overview of the rationale and role for SARS-CoV-2 sequencing in epidemiological surveillance and investigation. At the national level, sequencing is important for monitoring the emergence and distribution of new strains of SARS-CoV-2 with the potential implications for transmission, testing, or treatment, especially after interventions such as vaccination. At the state and local levels, genomic data can provide a more granular picture of the ongoing transmission to support control efforts. For example, by detecting clusters, investigating outbreaks, and identifying superspreading events. U.S. public health laboratories and territories have made significant strides in developing capacity for pathogen genome sequencing. As you can see on the map, the number of states that have sequencing capacity in red increased between 2013 and 2020. However, even in the best resource jurisdictions, sequencing is constrained by cost, not only in materials, but in staff time required to generate and analyze sequencing data. It is essential for epidemiologists to stay in communication with laboratory and bioinformatics colleagues to set sequencing priorities and adapt them as needed when conditions change. To optimize your use of SARS-CoV-2 sequencing, think first about what you hope to accomplish and then how best to do so with the resources available. When we asked epidemiologists and laboratory scientists in state public health departments how they prioritize specimens for SARS-CoV-2 sequencing, their answers map to two overarching themes, targeted outbreak investigations and surveillance. Outbreak investigations typically start with an epidemiological defined group of case patients who share characteristics that increase the risk of transmission. Examples include people living in high risk congregate living settings and those with shared exposures that represent a potential super spreader event. State-level surveillance for emerging strains, as at the national level, monitors the distribution and trends in SARS-CoV-2 variants in the population. Laboratory-based surveillance can select specimens for sequencing based on test characteristics, such as S-gene target failure on PCR. This finding is typical of the variant of concern, or VOC, known as B.1.1. .17 or alpha. In addition, epidemiological surveillance of COVID-19 cases can be of particular interest for sequencing. For example, cases of potential reinfection, vaccine breakthrough, travel exposure, or severe COVID-19 in children. Here are some examples of case studies in the toolkit that illustrate the motivation for sequencing and the insights it can provide in or epidemiologists involved in COVID-19 surveillance and outbreak investigations. You can find these case studies in the section of this toolkit. We surveyed state and territorial public health labs to assess their capabilities to sequence for SARS-CoV-2. When asked for technical considerations that factor into the selection of specimens for sequencing, they named genomic completeness, CT thresholds, and sequencing workflow. <laughs> 
They reported CT values between 28 and 37 as ideal for ensuring that significant genomic sequencing data could be recovered. This schematic is a high level representation of the steps involved to generate sequencing data. The workflow includes both wet lab and dry lab components. For our purposes, the wet lab component includes the first two steps, sample collection and sample prep, where we extract genetic material and prepare it to be included in the sequencing library. The dry lab components include the last two steps, sequencing and bioinformatics analyses, required to produce results that are useful for genomic epidemiology. Each of these steps requires trained personnel. Several US laboratories reported having about three dedicated personnel for both the wet lab and dry lab. But in a few instances, only one person is handling the entire wet lab portion of this workflow. CDC is making ongoing efforts to support cross-training and help labs in this situation get up to speed. For example, CDC's Technical Outreach and Assistance to States team, TOAST, is providing technical assistance, including developing bioinformatic pipelines and protocols for both wet and dry labs to help remove barriers. In addition to the motivation and technical considerations for sequencing, there are a few more overarching things that you may want to consider when onboarding sequencing in your laboratory for SARS-CoV-2. Let's break this down into people, places, and things. For the purposes of this module, we will define people as a trained workforce to handle the wet lab and dry lab components of sequencing or genomic epidemiology, places as laboratory space to house the sequencing instruments and perform the necessary operations to generate and analyze sequencing data, and finally, things, as the items such as reagents, tips, and pipettes for the wet lab components and the computing infrastructure to handle the dry lab components. One size does not fit all when it comes to sequencing strategies and laboratory capacity. The next set of slides, we will provide examples of beginner, intermediate, and advanced laboratories and their potential capabilities based on observations around the U.S. For the purposes of this module, we will refer to capacity in terms of equipment access, associated supplies, and personnel needed to perform sequencing. A beginner lab is one that never or rarely uses sequencing for surveillance or outbreak investigation. This lab probably doesn't have sufficient in-house capacity to handle both the wet lab and dry lab components for sequencing. There may be a single person performing both sequencing and analytics, or perhaps only sequencing library preparation can be handled on site. A handful of US public health laboratories have reported to need to submit some samples or specimens to a collaborator for sequencing. This can be an appropriate way to address capacity issues and should be considered if there are obstacles to rapidly standing up high throughput sequencing. Next, let's take a look at what could be considered as an intermediate laboratory. An intermediate lab occasionally uses sequencing for outbreak and surveillance activities. This lab probably has more wet lab capacity than dry lab capacity. About half of US state laboratories describe themselves as intermediate. This can perform sequencing and primary bioinformatics analyses. However, lack capacity for high throughput processes, and as a result, they struggle to handle large increase in sequencing. Some intermediate labs have addressed this issue by forming partnerships with labs with high throughput capacity. An advanced lab routinely uses sequencing in outbreak and surveillance activities on a large scale. They probably have multiple sequencing instruments are able to perform sequencing on hundreds to thousands of specimens monthly. They have access to a high performance computing environment, such as cloud computing or a computing cluster. 
They also have multiple highly trained staff who perform specialized wet lab and dry lab tasks. After generating sequencing data, it's important to, con important to consider submitting them to a public health repository like GSA or NCBI. By uploading your data, you contribute to the collective knowledge base for open source resources like NextStream, which in turn provide essential context for your own analyses. Check out module 3.6 for information about public repositories for SARS-CoV-2 sequence data and links to resources. Be sure to check out your own organization's requirements and protocols for submitting data. Now you're ready to integrate genomic sequence data into your epidemiological investigations. For example, to identify the most prevalent strain circulating within your population or to analyze transmission in an apparent outbreak. Here are some more toolkit models that discuss how to get started with genomic epidemiology. In this module, we discuss motivations for sequencing SARS-CoV-2 to enhance epidemiological surveillance and investigations. We outlined a few technical considerations to keep in mind, like how much of the genome to sequence, is sequence the spike protein sufficient? Sample quality, does the CT value suggest the success of sequencing? And capacity for handling the wet lab and dry lab components for sequencing. Finally, we presented a few different strategies depending on your laboratory capacity. Understand your motivation and technical capabilities will help you to ensure you are getting a maximum return on your sequencing efforts. This concludes module 3.6. Part three of this toolkit focuses on useful tools and skills for using genomic data in epidemiological investigations. Please visit the COVID-19 Genomic Epidemiology Toolkit page where you can find further reading on this topic as well as a short survey to provide feedback about this module. On the toolkit page, you can also subscribe to our mailing list and receive announcements as new modules and material are released. Thank you.